Uh, I'm Austin Moore, I'm from the University of Huddersfield, and I'm going to present uh, my research, which is looking into the sonic signature of the LA-2A, which, which now is part of it. Okay, so I'll just initially uh, start off by uh, stating the aims and objectives that I, um, that, that, you know, that I put down once I, you know, before I start the actual research. Aims, I want to investigate how the LA-2A uh, is used by producers, so that was one of my uh, aims initially. I wanted to see how they were kind of using that piece of equipment. Specifically, I wanted to see how they were uh, describing the sound quality and what particular sources seemed to be quite popular um, when processing uh, audio material with that compressor. I wanted to investigate the sonic signature, which is kind of a word that comes up by a lot of the word I use, which is basically just a sonic identity, if you like. What it's doing to the sound, what are the parts of the sound, what you think about that, that particular piece of that equipment. And I also wanted to investigate differences between LA 2 x So we hear quite a lot that, you know, this one sounds better, that one sounds a little bit different. This is the golden ticket and so on. And so I wanted to investigate that difference. So the objectives for the data will be gathered and analyzed to get a better understanding of how just to use the LA 2 to describe its like signature. So there's a qualitative aspect to the research. And then onto the kind of techie, more techie side of things, the more objective side of things, more quantitative research. Uh, measurements were made on a number of LA2As using standard kind of things, test tones, sweeps, bursts, and so on and so forth. Obviously, because we're dealing with music, we didn't want to just put tones to it, we can only tell so much from analyzing the output of test tones and so on. So, we want to pro pro process complex program material, music, uh, through these uh, devices, uh, through specifically a number of these LA2As to investigate this difference. Measurements then to be compared and contrasted to look for variation in the devices. And uh, a number of audio features were extracted or would be extracted from the complex program material to make up kind of data sets and then I can statistically analyze that okay, to look for differences. Now, if you've read the abstract, I was going to go on to do some listening tests today to kind of validate this perception, but I didn't get time to do that, unfortunately, so that'll be our next step. Hopefully they'll be able to do that as an online thing, so anybody that wants to participate here can participate in that. And now I'm saying that these things are ugly, I think it's the thing of beauty. Uh, here's a shot from one of the uh, Teletronics LA2As that I tested. Um, and this one actually does look a little bit worse for the wear here. This is actually an LA2, uh, which is kind of the older brother of the LA2A. Okay? So these are two of the devices I tested. So if you're not familiar with the devices, that's kind of what they look at. Um, sort of tapping onto what uh, 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 Matt was saying about the kind of use, I mean, the LA2A is a very simple piece of equipment to use. It's basically a peak reduction control, and that's it. Yeah? You can adjust the kind of makeup game with the uh, game control, but in terms of the user interface, it's incredibly simple. Just go through this very quickly. Um, in terms of how the LA2A works, uh, it's an optical compressor. You're probably familiar, people who are into compressors know there's different styles of compression. Typically, the style of compression is dictated by the component or element that's doing the game reduction, okay? So it could be a FET, it could be a valve, uh, it could be a BCA or whatever. In this instance here, it's an opto um, compressor, okay? Because it's got this opto block in here, which is a, a T4 cell, which we'll get to in one second. So the input goes in, but an input transformer here, which we'll get some coloration from. Okay, it could be pretty slight, probably quite slight, but we may get some coloration from the transformer, which is part of the sonic density. We'll take a split of the signal here, and it depends upon the uh, uh, position of the peak control, which is just a variable resistor. We will say that we will then send a sidechain voltage, okay? Which will go into this amplifier to uh, increase the level, go into a preamp, this is folded here, which is a little trim in the back of an LA2A, which is called, I think it's the R37 uh, trim in the back. Usually that's set flat, but it can be changed so the compressor responds differently to frequencies. Okay? It compresses a little bit harder than the top frequencies if you manipulate that control. And then it goes into another driver, it goes into this important part, just to the T4 cell, which is basically where the compression activity occurs. Okay? And there's an electroluminescent panel, basically a light, uh, night light in this T4 cell that shines brighter or dimmer in accordance basically with variations in the side chain signal. Okay? And then it says the photoresistor, there's a photoresistor in there as well, and this resistance is produced as the lights get brighter, and vice versa. Yeah? So in a really extreme example here, blue resistance gets low impedance path, which basically shunts all the audio to ground. If it shunted all of it, we wouldn't hear anything. Higher resistance allows more of the audio signal to path, and that basically creates the compression. Okay? So I've given two extreme examples in there. 
then uh, into another um, uh, valve, a uh, bit of negative feedback here to linearize the uh, signal, and then into another output transformer, and that's the job done. So it's a pretty, pretty simple kind of block, but we do have points in this block, the transformer, the valves, the T4 cell, uh, that uh, will affect the sonic signature. Okay, so they're going to be the things that impart this special sauce, as Niall says, onto the audio signal. So just going back to that T4 cell, so that's the important part. That's probably arguably one of the most important parts in the compressor. Yeah. It plays an important role in its time of response. 10 millisecond uh, attack. Uh, the, some of the original manuals were incorrect. Had a 10 microsecond attack, which was actually incorrect. Okay, they both needed that change that made newer manuals. But it is a 10 millisecond attack, which is fast, really. Okay, uh, uh, but now it's considered slow because the compressors are much faster acting, such as the 1176 VZA compressors and so on. Uh, it was quick for optical compressors. There were other optical compressors before this that were just a little bit slower to respond. The release is interesting. It's a two-stage release. So the kind of first stage occurs over 40 milliseconds, and then we've got a second stage that occurs over, over a, couple, a few seconds, really. And you'll see there's variations in this response when I plot it out. The release is program dependent, which is a nice feature of the compressor. Okay? It results in a longer release at uh, times that the unit has been compression, uh, in compression for a long time, or the amount of gain reduction has been considerable. Yeah, so that's kind of, kind of what you would want. Yeah? You wouldn't want it to start pumping. You may, but if you want the compressor that doesn't pump, the LA2E is going to give you that behavior. There's also some slight frequency dependency, meaning that it compresses some frequencies more than others. Yeah? And that's down to kind of how the light responds, basically. Yeah? So it responds to very variations in voltage, but also it's kind of frequency dependent. Okay? It'll shine brighter or uh, 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 dimmer depending on some of the frequencies. Not much, but a little, just a little. So that's a little bit of background on how the device works. So everyone should be up to speed on that now, hopefully. So, the first thing I want to do is the quality side of the research. And I employ a technique which is called tax mining. Okay? Using the statistical package R, package study text, DPLYR, and ggplot2, which allows you to comb through a load of data and start to look for the most common words, frequency of words. You can actually get in and start to look for correlations between words, whether words are positive or negative, and so on. So it's very powerful. I use it in quite a simple sense, and I was just simply doing a bit of content analysis, where I wanted to comb through as many reviews as I could find of the LA2A, I thought a good source to work with was the Universal Audio LA2A level of collection reviews. Um, I actually wanted to get more than the 333 reviews we've got, but the kind of little infinite scroll um, uh, um, uh, piece of code on the uh, website kind of screwed up once it got to 334 reviews, so I couldn't get any further than that. But I think it's a decent, it's a good, considerable number of reviews to work with to get an understanding of what these users are saying about the piece of equipment. Okay. Now, yes, I know it's the plug-in version of it, but you know, I thought that the trade-off, you know, that the users talking about a plug-in was worth it because it could get a hold of a lot of reviews in one place in tax mine. So I was very out, to get a to get a handle on how to describe the sound quality and which sources they were compressing with that compressor. Okay, those were the two things I wanted to do. Okay, so it's a set of used R, different packages. Text was then clean, but obviously we're taking uh, reviews and there's, all, there's people typing all sorts of things in there. Okay, so there are actual reviews. So text was cleaned, so it took away uh, um, uh, capitalization, uh, punctuation, just basically cleaned it to raw text. Stop words removed were just common words such as as the, whatever man, as is. And as well as that, data was then examined, but I kept doing that to look for words that were basically redundant, that didn't tell me anything. So words like plug in, price, rate, all those different types of things. They weren't really answering my research questions. Yeah. And from that, some word frequency plots were generated. And we can see at the very top, the vocals and bass, well, vocal is the word. That's mentioned most of the source is mentioned most, okay? Forgetting all the other words like and, if, and so on, okay? The important words. Next, we've got bass. 
Okay, so that's another source. You can see here we've got guitar and guitars. Actually, when I did a bit of, con 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 of um, contextual analysis, which you can do in R, you can have a look at the context. Quite often it was bass and guitars were together. So people were usually talking about the bass guitar or bass guitars. Of course, we're talking about guitars. You know, electric guitars, you know, electric guitar. But quite often that was coupled with bass and guitars. Another word that came up was easy. People find it easy to use, as we just illustrated. It's got that control, you just crank it and you get more compression. This is the timer response, there's a lot of work for you. This was interesting, the descriptor smooth came up, a smooth sound. This one I actually should have taken out, it's a redundant word, okay? People are putting a lever in there because the actual name of the package is a So I should have removed that really. Then we've got guitars, we've got character, acoustic, which I guess is going with the guitars as well, so acoustic guitars, and then warm. Okay, so we can see here that these are the two kind of descriptors that we come out, we pull out, okay? So the sources are the vocals and the bass guitar, and the two descriptors that we can pull out here are smooth and warm, okay? They seem to be the two descriptors that people are using for that piece of equipment. Just to try that over again, I did the same call of the study, which was um, to, uh, uh, it was actually a, a slightly longer survey than this. There were four questions, but for this piece of research, I'm going to focus on these two questions, okay? They were all very simple questions, it was just to actually elicit some descriptors from users. So I surveyed, created a survey which asked people simply to describe the sonic signature of the LA2 by compressed vocals, same thing again with compressed bass. And the participants were asked to use up the four descriptors, okay? I want to get words that describe the sound quality. That was, most people did that, most respondents did that, but of course I had people type in sentences and so on. So of course I had to then tidy up that text to just generate and extract just descriptors. The survey was sent to producers that I knew, producers that had done research with me before, circulated around our record production email list. Um, so you could say it's kind of what would be called non-probability judging sampling. Yeah, I kind of hand-picked the people I was going to approach, yeah, because they were experts, yeah, they use it us. Again, the results, so yeah, obviously it wasn't random, that's the point I'm trying to make. Results, we then compile plot it using a GE plot again in R, and we get these descriptors, okay? Right off the top of the bat, we can see that smooth, warm, and round, for both sources, are the most popular descriptors, okay? Then we've got all the words like rich, full, thick, mid, slow, forward, controlled, full, tight, rich, punchy, fat, and so on. Okay? But those ones we can see, particularly for the beat, uh, for the bass, uh, are, there's a fairly significant result there. Okay? Um, now, we could argue yeah, that these two are actually possibly synonyms for one another. I'm not sure. I haven't done that analysis yet. That's probably the area for further research. To see if there's any redundancy in these terms, yeah. To see if smooth and round are actually very similar. Okay. I, I guess they are. I guess these are related to the time and response, yeah. And the warm, warmth is a term that's related to perhaps to what's going on with the transformers and the valves. Okay. Of course, these people could be seeing these words because they've read them 5,000 times before by other producers. That's what was coming out, okay, of that analysis. Okay, so moving on to the objective methods. So I kind of found that those, those two uh, sources were the most popular compressed of the LA2A. So I found six LA2As, and actually find it's five LA2As and one LA2, over three studios. Uh, audio material was output, so I basically had a clean signal path. I worked with 96K, metric field of IO, so nothing else was in the signal path. Okay, so we went to the studios, took everything out of the racks, the LA2A, went straight into the IOs. So as I said, science streams were used to measure THD with the frequency response. Um, if you might remember, I said there's a bit of frequency dependency with regard to how much it compresses, okay? So I came up with a, a, a test where I would reference Okay, they transfer a plot of the compression against one K tone, yeah. And then look how much it deviated with these other tones. It'll be a bit clearer once you see the plots. See how much it compressed the other frequencies more or less than that one K. Okay. Test tone burst. So we'll show you a burst in a second. We used to look at the timer response, any variations in the response. And then vocals and bass tracks were processed for three separate songs through six units. Material was compressed at this is what I want to aim for, minus 3, minus 6, minus 12 dB of gain reduction, so we get a bit of variation in how hard it's been hit. Um, 
Pep put it open levels with Modric in the box, yeah, the, the, the VU meter in LA2 is a little bit unreliable, yeah, it's a bit slow to respond, there's variations in them. So I, was, I monitored how much beam reduction I was getting by monitoring the output, and then the input as it came back in, so I was pretty accurate on that, okay, you got to a decimal point, yeah, which I was very uptime uh, about observing and, and recording the spreadsheets. And let's see what came out. Okay, so this is an example of a burst tone. So what we got here, this isn't the actual burst I used, I couldn't find it, I didn't have enough time to plot it in my lab this morning, but I used another burst I used, and the only difference between this burst and the burst I used is there's a little bit more of this bit here, okay? So we, uh, the burst I used starts a block, just like this, and that block, and that's not compressing. Then there's a little blip, you can kind of see it here, it goes over, and the, the compressor starts compressing, which is a very fast little blip, it's 20 milliseconds. Back to this. The compressor is not compressing again. Bang into another block where the compressor is compressing for a longer period of time, and then bang into this where the compressor is then going into recovering. Okay, so the reason why we've got that is to check for that program dependency. Yeah, because it responds differently to fast and slow. Uh, sorry, it responds differently to the, the transients versus more steady state portion. Okay, so this little blip will be transient steady state portion. Okay, so in terms of the frequent response, uh, these ones pretty group pretty close together. There's a fair little dip off here with these two. Uh, again, I've been a little bit lazy. I haven't actually got in the uh, LA2A names here, so you look at ignore the fact that I can't tell you which LA2A is which at the minute. But generally, I'm just looking for broad trends to look for differences, yeah? And it's pretty consistent as we would expect. And around here, there's these two LA2As, they kind of tail off a fair bit from 10k. The drop is by about well, half a dB, isn't it? Yeah, by, by the time it gets to about 15k, 12k, 15k, it rolls off then up to over towards 20k, and there's about 2k dip at that point. Yeah, so they're pretty consistent. A little bit of a roll off then at top end and a couple of them, which could lead someone to reject those LA2As. They don't think they're a lot of bites, but they don't think they've got a lot of sheen in their hands. As well, remember I can't vouch, okay? I did ask in the studios every time that these being maintained well, and I know that some of the LA2As had just been calibrated before I came in, so I know at least two of them have been rigorously tested just before I came in. I can't vouch for the others, but I'm told all the time that techs were calibrating them in the studios. In terms of the harmonic distortion, Pull it out, we've got all the LA2A, so we can see there's a bit of variation going on here. And there's certainly one LA2A, which is plotting here, which is a fair bit dirtier than the others. Okay? The others are kind of plotting roughly within, that's not going to be that percept uh, perceivable the difference around here. Okay? You know, it looks a bit of a lot of plots, not that much really. You can see as well though, that there is a bit of difference in the, in the response over the frequency range. Yeah? So we've got a bit of a, a little bit more. Distortion. This is distortion, okay? This is plot in THD, which is a way to plot distortion, distortion characteristics. It's not a brilliant way to plot distortion, but it's an objective way to plot distortion. And we can see that, yeah, we do get a little bit more distortion at the bottom end. Possibly a little bit transformer, not 100% sure. Smooths off a little bit, but it becomes a bit more consistent here uh, over in this area from 1K. Pretty much responds relatively consistent, some little variations upwards of the 10K. But we can see that there is variation in that, in that distortion response. I'm not going to go through all the plots for the uh, uh, transfer function. So this is that test where I plotted the, the 1K compression activity against all the other test tones that I used, which is 4K, 2K, 500, 250, 125. I'll use this one first so we can see that the 1K here, at the time, we, I can't exactly remember how many dBU it was at this point. Well, we can see that there's a bit of variation here, okay? A little bit of variation, maybe half a dB, maybe come up to one dB, and how it, it compresses the frequencies okay, that I push through there, okay? So it's slightly more, compressing more on some of the frequencies, typically the low frequencies, and a little bit more lean on the higher frequencies, okay? And again, these compressors were all set with that R37 pocket flat, okay, so it's flat line in it. Again, we've got this one, similar thing. They're all starting to pop together here, so it's not that clear. There's a small little bit of variation, but you can see the variation of how it compresses the frequencies is, a, is less in this one, okay? Now this one, 
There's the LA2, and there's the other way around. Okay, and I've looked at this again to make sure I didn't make a mistake. Yeah, I'll, I'll, have, I'll have to check it again. I have to admit that when I was plotting these out, it was with a 19 week year old baby in the background in Greece when we were in Holly. So I might have made a mistake then, I don't know. But I did double check this, and it did seem to be compressed in the frequencies the other way around. It was the opposite in this one. It was compressing. Uh, where was I? Wrong, wrong, wrong. It was compressing the uh, higher frequencies more so than the lower frequencies. Okay, which was just the opposite of what we just said. Looking at the response to these burst plots, sorry, I'm going to have to go very quickly now. I'm taking a little bit more time than I thought. We can see here that there's a, a, a fair bit of consistency in how they're actually responding with that transient, yeah? There's a, a little bit of variation in how much it's responding, recovering after that transient, but not much. Well, the more, more variation occurs here, okay, with this longer steady state portion, okay, where, where we can see clearly that this one here. Ignore my per labeling, okay, but this LA284 is actually the LA2. And we can see that that one is consistently slower to respond than the others, which generally group together quite well, okay? There's another one here, which is called the LA285, which is a little bit slower to respond than the other LA2As, but they're generally in the same ballpark, okay, in terms of the timing response. Not a great deal of variation. Okay, go on very quickly. I'll have to go through this uh, quite quick. So the complex program material, which is the music, was edited for analysis. Okay, so it took a portion of that audio material, yeah, which was usually a chorus, yeah, about four bars of chorus. Ten audio features were extracted using the virtual box from MATLAB. Okay, if you're not familiar with audio features, they can basically allow us to examine audio in kind of low-level detail. Okay, so we can look at certain aspects of the spectral contents, the uh, uh, kind of time domain of the audio, how many inharmonic frequencies are in there. Basically, an examination of timbre. Okay, these are used very often in timbre studies. So there were the 10 uh, features were the centroid brightness, spectral flux, roughness, low energy, zero crossing, roll off, attack time, spectral spread, ketosis. A lot of them, as I said, have to do with frequency response, and time domain response of the audio. Okay, there's little features that allow us to describe how the sound varied, what it's doing to the timbre. Yeah, that's used very often in timbre studies where people want to say, hey, these are violins, and these are cellos. How can we do that? How can we do that objectively? We can extract features from those notes and see how they vary in a more sort of finite, small, kind of micro level. If you imagine an FFT is a macro level, we go down to a micro level, we start to use audio features. Okay, so they were extracted from all the sources of all the songs. I'll go through this basically. You can read that yourself if you want to, but basically, we've got a lot of features. Okay, all songs. All, 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 all time and response, all, all uh, game reduction amounts for the three songs, which ended up with 30 variables and 19 observations, which is a lot of data. So what you can do to, uh, what's the word, make this data easier to work with is carry out a common statistical procedure in these instances, which is called principal component analysis, which you transform all of those features into the most important stuff. I'll make it really easy, okay? And then we can plot it out in a scatter plot, or if you want to plot it out, we can plot it out in a three-dimensional dimensional plot with three components. I've got two. So the reason why I was doing that, why I was doing that, I wanted to start to look for clusters to see if these compressors did start to cluster together, yeah? To see if there were differences in them. So I used a clustered method called k-means, which is a very common thing to use. Okay, and this, so if you look at th this method comes from timbre studies, yeah, and very common to use timbre studies. We want to classify instruments, we extract features, we uh, use principal component analysis, and then we k-means cluster them to see these things cluster. So it's like, hey, there's the piano, and there's the harp, and there's the guitar, and we can start to build the picture. Okay, so the computer can figure out what's what. So the expectation is, first of all, that the uh, three game reduction mice would cluster together, which was largely right. There we go, okay? So that's pretty much not that interesting. But if you look at the plots, you'll start to see that some of the compressors started to group together, okay? So from LA2, A2, 3, and 6 started to group together, and 1, 4, 5 started to group together. So these compressors started to group together. They started to bunch together, okay? I'm going to go through this really quick. When you're doing uh, this type of K-means clustering, you use an elbow plot to figure out how many clusters you want. So what this elbow plot look like, you can go into six clusters. Call it an elbow plot, which kind of looks like when you're in yeah? 
It's not a precise method, but six clusters looks like it's something to observe. But when we do any six clusters, we'll see something similar. No compressor, clock pumps on its own. Two, three, and six low, clump on their own. Uh, two, three, and six money at medium, clump together. Uh, one, four, and five clump together. One, four, five clump together here, okay? For these low and high settings. So there are differences coming out of these compressors, okay? Some of them are more alike than others. All right, I can't quite answer that just yet. I haven't done the analysis, but this is what's telling me. Same thing for the, where are we? Okay, for the base, okay? If we move on to the base, we'll see a similar pattern. So in this one, the initial analysis just to cluster them by three. It didn't cluster them by gain reduction this time. It actually clustered them into those two, three, and six, and those four and five groups. So it could identify these groups of compressors, yeah. suggesting that there is perceptual differences between these. And then when we clustered down again, look at the envelope plot, six clusters seem to be the way to go. And we did have that two, three, six, two, three, six, one, four, five cluster again coming out. All very interesting, but can people hear that? Great question. That's the next thing to do. Okay. Computer says yes. Let's see if humans say yes as well. So, conclusions. The LA2A is commonly used in the vocal base. Most popular descriptors were smooth, warm, and round. It's not clear which aspects give the, the, this sonic signature. I'm arguing that it's probably the timer response that creates smooth and round uh, descriptors. And more probably comes from the transformer, the harmonics, and the valves, i.e., harmonic distortion. Variation in units, time of response pretty close, some uh, variation in harmonic distortion, frequency dependency. Cluster analysis was able to identify these two groups of LA2As, which may sound more alike. We don't quite know yet if that's going to be perceivable. Uh, analysis needs to be carried out to investigate uh, what it is that makes groups 2, 3, and 6 and 1, 4, and 5 cluster. It's not clear if these differences are going to be significant on the tests. Listen, experiments need to be conducted to see if people can identify those clusters. So, they are different. We can tell the differences, okay? And also, what these smooth and round descriptors actually mean. And um, that's it. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.